Okay, thanks, Brooke, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to address something rather more general, and I'm going to look at uh, the idea of Britain's um, famous Roman monument, Britain's most famous Roman monument, as a multi-temporal frontier work. And I'm going to break the sort of chronolog chronological sequence that we've been following, if you want, um, deliberately, to raise some issues, which came up, if you were here last, yesterday afternoon, they came up a bit in some of the points we were discussing. Um, I want to look at the creation of frontier communities in Roman times and how this has been made to interact with the perceived roles of this monument through time as a national and international divider and also a heritage monument. So I'm going to move through time quite swiftly. And I, really, mobilities and migration are central to my paper, so I'm coming back to some of the issues that were covered in the first paper or two. Um, I'm going to look at three periods in the world history towards history to highlight this. I'm going to look at the second to fourth centuries, which is, if you want, the Roman past. The Renaissance, very briefly, in the 16th to 17th centuries, and the present. And my aim is really to, and this is something I've been doing for some time, to identify the way that ideas about the identities of the communities of this frontier landscape at these different times have been created through reference to the monumental Roman past. So, I'm not really going to talk particularly about the Roman archaeology in any detail whatsoever. I haven't got time anyway. Um, so part of the aim of what I'm doing is to think about how we address the idea of the past and the present and how ideas of the past are recreated in different ages. And I don't have time to talk about the complexity of that issue. We could actually discuss it, some of us in the audience and I could discuss it for hours. But I wanted to look at the way that knowledge of the past is transformed by each generation in the present, sorry, in the context of present concerns and interests, which, as many people have said, creates an entanglement between the past and the present. And primarily, I'm trying to argue that it's really important that we seek to conceptualize this process. So we need to move forward again. Ideas always need to move forward because the past is always changing, because the relevance of the past and the presence is always changing. I can't accept the idea that is dominant in some studies heritage, and I am very interested in heritage studies, that the past, the distant past, is irrelevant and has been studied enough. In, rea in reality, from my perspective, we have to rewrite the past in every generation. So if we imagine the ancient past can be left behind, to study issues in the present or issues to do with the future, we're devaluing our roots, effectively. Now, if we think about Hadrian's Wall in the present, Hadrian's Wall is currently a major international draw for tourists. And unfortunately, this map here, which I photographed about three or four years ago in a very nice pub on Hadrian's Wall, has been taken down and this is the best image I have of it, which won't mean much to you at all on the screen with the lights on. But basically, people um, who are visiting this heritage landscape in northern England are invited to put a little um, marker in to indicate where they've come from. And the geopolitics of this diagram are really quite interesting. They do indicate you know, how far flung the people who visit Hadrian's Wall today are. And uh, I won't make many comments apart from to observe that the dominant in areas on the map are areas of Europe and North America, areas of the world um, which people from Europe have moved to. Um, there are quite a number of markets in China, which is the Great Wall of China, and some of the parallels that have been drawn between these frontiers. Very few from North Africa and the Middle East, or the Near East, which we know why that's the case. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us something, it's not reliable, but it tells us something about where people come from to visit this World Heritage Site. Now, when we look at the way that uh, the heritage of Hadrian's Wall is interpreted, this is picked up very much. Um, the idea of multinational communities, multi-ethnic communities, whatever you want to call them, in the Roman past. So we know that Roman soldiers came to serve on this frontier from various areas of the Mediterranean and North Europe. So people in the ancient past, 2,000 years ago, moved in large numbers into this landscape. And I'm going to have a look at some of the academic connotations of this sort of idea in a moment. But this is a very popular thing that is actually used 
as an encouragement for people from across the world to visit this ancestral frontier landscape. Now, one of the things that we think about a lot, and this is to do with Roman identity, is how to communicate this ancient frontier landscape. And English heritage and museums like Vindolanda have really created a more complex interpretation of what the Roman army was in the distant past, um, including, uh, as well as legionaries, auxiliary soldiers, women and children. But it's still true that a large part of the public heritage discourse focuses around legionary soldiers. And OK, they were really important elements of the Roman military forces in Britain. Um, if you go to the Diva experience in Chester during your time here, if you haven't been already, you'll see how much that blows up the idea of legionary organisation. Now, perhaps that's OK in the context of Chester, but it's not appropriate for a lot of our Roman period monuments which may have been built by legionaries in some cases, but were not occupied by legionaries. So we have a focus in education and in the media on the identity of legionary soldiers in the Roman past. And these people, I have to say, tend to be very accessible, very pleasant to visitors, very supportive to children who uh, meet them. They talk usually with English accents. And to my knowledge, none of them come from the South Mediterranean or Eastern Mediterranean. We occasionally have Italian legionary reenactors brought to Hadrian's Wall as part of English Heritage's educational activities. But I am talking about the ancient past as well as the present because archaeology has really reflected deeply on a lot of the issues I'm talking about. And if you follow writings about reenactment, archaeologists and some reenactors have actually problematized the idea of focusing too much on the idea of the legionary soldier to say that we ought to study military communities in broader terms. Now, when we look at academic studies and try and understand this Roman period landscape, we even have an increasing information in Northern England about the local populations that interacted with the Roman military. So I have to say, I mean, now in the northeast of England, at least we've got rather further, and I know the evidence for this region of the country too, um, we've got rather further an understanding of the way the military are interacting with local peoples. So we have more and more complex information about the sort of um, heritages that we're presenting to people today. And just to back up my earlier map showing where people have come from to visit Hadrian's Wall in the modern world, this is a map showing the areas of the Roman Empire that supplied um, legionaries, sorry, supplied soldiers and people to the population along Hadrian's Wall. Now, if you know much about what's been going on in the popular media, you'll probably know about Mary Beard and the average Romano British family, which um, was a debate that, uh, a very negative, emotional debate that developed last year. And we've had a lot of work on ADNA analysis and archaeological science, which has, for the whole province of Britannia, started to pursue these sort of issues of mobility and migration. Now, going back to an earlier talk when Manuel was talking about the Roman army, does it concern us that when our school children meet legionary reenactors, they talk with English accents, or Welsh accents, or occasionally Scottish accents? They're very civilised. They don't tend, on the whole, they show weapons, but they don't use them very much. And they keep order. They talk about all the positive, constructive things the Roman army is supposed to have done. Now, OK, the Roman army may have done some of those things, but they also killed large numbers of people. I think we need a balance. And, OK. Perhaps we can't do that with school children. <laughs> <laughs> but school children grow up, and what do they think about the Roman army? Okay? And do they think, you know, that the legionaries were very, very common in Britain? Because we know they weren't. They weren't even of the, the majority of popul the population here, in this particular place. So we need to think about balancing our interpretations and for adults. Why can't we deal with violence in heritage interpretation? There's plenty of violence in the modern world. If we don't deal with violence in the ancient world, some of our young people think the past was better than the present. And I have some evidence for that, okay? Was the past better than the present? I'm trying to be a bit optimistic in saying that. So I'm going to step back in time a bit and think about another message, and I'm going to do this very briefly. Um, in the Renaissance, in the late 16th, early 17th century, James I, who tried to unite Scotland and England into Great Britain, 
saw this landscape, the frontier landscape, the landscape of the Picts Wall, which is what Hadrian's Wall was called then, as something that might become the centre of his flourishing kingdom. And I'm quoting a text there, which I won't give you the reference to. And we have some representations of Hadrian's Wall. My favourite one is from Drayton's Polyolbion and Picts Wall. Hadrian's Wall is right in the middle of that image as a man. Now here, the Romans are seen as Italians. The Italians weren't entirely positive in the Renaissance mind. Okay, the Renaissance was occurring in Italy. But there were lots of negative connotations to Italians in the late 16th and early 17th centuries in the minds of the educated elite. But this is when we first have scholarship. It's when we first have the collection of inscriptions. It's when the monument first starts to be interpreted and studied. Um, we have an initiative today, going back to my sort of um, cross-temporal, rather entangled narrative, which is intended to encourage a, uh, a revival of these borderlands. Now, we all get fixated by the economic problems of our regions. And I know there are lots of debates about the economy of this region. Um, the north of England has been in recession since Margaret Thatcher. And it's in worse recession now than it was 12 years ago. Um, so the idea of a renaissance on the borderland is something that I think a lot of people working in heritage and archaeology archeolog are very keen to encourage. Now, to me, this is a model, in a way, for the idea of that renaissance eroding time again. But going back to Hadrian's Wall in the second century and thinking about some of the issues we have, one of the public appreciations of Hadrian's Wall is, is a divider between England and Scotland. And just watch this develop now in our current environment with the debates that are going on. If we have another referendum, how much of the votes either side of that monument are going to be differentiated from each other? And how much trouble is that going to cause us? And I'm not a supporter of May, I have to say. It does concern me a bit. Okay, this is another reference of Hadrian's Wall as a sort of ancestral national divider. And this is something we've been looking at a bit in a number of projects I've been involved in. Now, what I'm really trying to do with this talk is say that we don't study the Roman past independent of the present. We don't study the Neolithic past independent of the present. We don't excavate our Roman forts independent of our concepts of the present. And this isn't something that will come to it as a surprise to anybody who follows theory in archaeology. We really need to think about how the past and the present are entangled and intertwined. Now, to me, if we think about concepts of bordering and discrepant populations, so if we think about the hybrid nature of frontiers and the transformative nature of frontiers, I thought that topic would come out a bit more powerfully in this session, I have to say, than it has so far. If we think about those issues, they're just as political as Romanization. So my generation, who spent a lot of time debating Romanization and trying to rubbish it, okay, it's a political concept, so is a concept of hybrid identities and transformative frontier populations. We're interested in those issues today because they mean something relevant to us. And they mean something relevant to us because we're trying to use the past to understand the present. That's a political motivation. And to me, I hope it's a motivation to try and make people generally more tolerant and more understanding and less prone to sort of divisive thoughts, which aren't really very helpful in such a problematic world. So to me, the past is really vital. And I, you know, if we think about the plenary, if we went to it last night, I couldn't more fundamentally disagree with the plenary. I know what Paulus Holtoff was saying. And I think I do agree with most of it. But the past has got to be vital to what we say. And to me, and I, okay, I'll say this, I, mean, I wasn't going to say it. If you want to try and influence the people in the present, write science fiction. Many more people write, read science fiction than archaeology. The past is so vital to us, but only if we think about its significance to us today. I know, Kate, okay, we need to try and think how to go forward in the future too. Thanks very much.